Okay, um, we'll go ahead and get started with the last talk before lunch. So, uh, no pressure, we'll say. So, I'm done at 11.50, is that correct? 11.50, right, Heidi? Right, right? Yes. Yeah, something like that, okay. So, let's go. Okay, uh, so uh, I'll introduce Dr. Jose Rodal, uh, PhD, I guess formerly in MIT, and um, uh, enjoyed his talk last year. We'll hear from him again. Thank you. You're not going to enjoy this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to, my presentation is going to comprise uh, number one, uh, nine confusions in the literature, then uh, correct formulation according to my opinion, some exact res uh, solution results, and uh, conclusions. So I'm going to start here with a quote from Martin in his recent article that there is a large discrepancy between theory and experimental results which has persisted for 27 years of development and that uh, raises doubts if the observed effects are due to mass fluctuations. And uh, last year at the Estes conference I uh, presented an exact solution of a two degree of freedom uh, model which uh, uh, match a number of uh, aspects, for example, uh, what the behavior is as you change the mass of the brass or the mass of the aluminum, other things, but there was one big problem which I had to use a coupling factor of one million times in order to match the experimental results. Again, in other words, the theory going from the second derivative of the local mass with respect to time predicts forces that are a million times larger than what appears in experiments. And I look for a number of uh, reasons and that I excluded, and I said, well, this has to uh, be fully explored. So, and this is a reason why I like to go to these nine confusions in the literature. The, Number one confusion starts from what is called phi in English or phi in Greek, which is the, which is the potential where people are confusing the local potential, which is practically zero, with the total universal potential, which is, is capital phi, which is of the order of one when you use uh, c squared. Let's start from the beginning to calculate the universe potential, capital Phi, in the way that Siama did it. He considered a solid ball of radius R with uniform density. He then calculated the integral of the uh, mass density over the volume. And if you consider a uniform mass density, it's easy to arrive at the conclusion which he arrived which is capital five is equal to minus three half the capital G, which is the constant of gravitation, times the mass of the universe divided by the radius of the observable universe. We, you can also uh, get uh, a, a, a more uh, uh, precision into the formula, if you take into account that he integrated between r equals zero, that meaning from the center of this ball to the outside. You can actually have a, a solution, uh, a very simple solution, for a solid ball of radius r with uniform density that the potential energy is actually uh, this function that depends on the little r square, such that if you compute this at the center, then you get the minus three half factor that Siama found. And the, uh, actually, the acceleration then, because uh, you are at r equals zero, then the acceleration at the center is zero. However, if you compute this at the edge of the observable universe, which doesn't make sense because there is no center and no edge, but from the point of view, of this model, there is, there, is an, there is an R, then actually, then you calculate that, that the periphery, capital Phi, is equal to 
minus gmr, so there's actually you have a coefficient of minus one. And that translates into an acceleration, which doesn't make much sense, but for the purpose of computing it, because the radius of the observable universe appears as a square, it's actually extremely small, phi to 10 to the minus 12 g's, so it's practically zero. So you can get uh, minus 3 half or 1. Actually, other people like uh, Norbert got other factors, 2, 4, 5. But you can also look at this uh, from the point of view of the shell theorem, of Newton's hollow shell theorem. Think of, uh, of a shell, and uh, because uh, the effect goes like 1 over r, but the surface is, of the shell is increasing like r, r uh, squared, uh, it turns out that the, what matters the most is the matter that is at the edge of the observable universe. So if you use the shell theorem, then you calculate the capital Phi with a coefficient of 1 minus gm divided by r. And the acceleration, of course, is 0 because the derivative of a constant is 0. So again, you can get 1 or 3 half. And uh, again, other people got other factors. Anyway. So the, the whole concept of max origin of inertia, remember, and I'm going to repeat this a number of times, is a quote from Schiofolini and Wheeler in their book from 1995, that the mass energy there, not here, there, and there means very far away, light billions of years away, rules the inertia here. This is a beautiful picture that actually was in uh, Gardner's book, the relativity explosion showing the mass energy there very far away grabbing something and being responsible for inertia. Now, this picture of the shell is also quite interesting because if you calculate the gravitational potential for a black hole, you also get, if you take into account the short shield uh, radius, you get also that is of order one. And uh, it's interesting because this idea of universe as a hologram, uh, for example, from Suskin, et cetera, you can see that inertia is, is due to the, the shell on the periphery of the observable universe. And uh, it's quite nice that also, you know, for example, Suskin thinks of the whole universe uh, of this shell being like a hologram that contains the information of uh, the universe. Anyway, so let's go to the, what the confusion is. Here is, uh, for example, a recent article, and it has the equations, and it has only one uh, phi. It doesn't have a phi. It doesn't have a capital phi. It has lowercase phi, which in general relativity is the local potential. OK, so what is this? Actually, the author was nice enough to actually define what he meant. Like he said, that, that uh, phi was the scalar potential of the local point mass. He explicitly wrote gm0 divided by r, which is the local mass. Not that mass there, this little mass here. If you calculate that local mass, what well, this is, he wrote that it was equal to 1. No, it's not 1, it's 0. It's practically 0, 10 to the minus something. So let's go back to the source, Siama. In his paper, he actually very carefully distinguish between the potential of the universe, which is capital Phi, from the local potential, which is lower, which is uh, lowercase Phi. And it is capital Phi, which is much, much larger than the, lo than the lowercase. You know, this is order one, this is practically zero, and that's with this plus this, then it's approximately one. But Siama himself distinguished between both of them. Let's calculate what this uh, potential uh, is. So here in this column, I have the potential. And uh, it's interesting because the potential is also the escape velocity goes like the square root of uh, minus 2 times the, the potential. So you can also think of the potential that is responsible for inertia is, is, is related to the escape velocity. So let's calculate the phi for the mega drive uh, mass of, let's say, of 0.1 kilograms at a radius of uh, 18 millimeters. You get 4 and 10 to the minus 27. 
when you divide it by c squared, extremely small, minus 27, extremely small number, and an extremely small, small escape velocity. Of course, it, wouldn't, it doesn't take much of a rocket to escape the mass of this tiny mega drive. At the air surface, you get 7 and 10 to the minus 10, an escape velocity of 11. At the, at the sun, somebody was asking the, yesterday what the mass of the sun is 2 and 10 to the 30. You get uh, about 10 to, 10 to the minus 9. At the sun surface, of course, you get a much, uh, significantly larger, which is about 2 and 10 to the minus 6. None of these numbers are close to 1. The Milky Way at, the, at our Earth location is approximately the same as being at the sun surface. It's also about 2 to 10 to the minus 6. You have to have something like a black hole at the event horizon using the Schwarzschild radius. Then you get 0.5. And this is a very interesting thing about uh, Max uh, principle. When Siama wrote his paper in 1953, he calculated phi, capital phi, the potential for the whole universe, to be close to one, and at that time he recognized that there, there were no black holes as far as astronomy was concerned from the point of view of experimental measurements. There were no neutron stars. There was very little knowledge of the universe. Yes? What about dark matter and dark energy? Shouldn't you there, 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 there wasn't that? No, sorry? Shouldn't you be integrating over those as well? Yes, I'm going to. Uh, people usually don't, but I, I uh, here in this calculation I didn't. I, I get 0.37. So if you take into account dark matter, you get uh, uh, something between 1 and 2. So it, as I'm going to show, it really, this is order 1. It really doesn't matter whether it's 0.5 or 1, because the black coefficient is really going to go away as far as the mega drive. I'm going to show that it really does, that, that prefactor really doesn't matter. Does so dark energy have the same sign or an opposite sign in terms of contributing to this? For some reason in the literature, people are considering dark matter, but they're not considering dark energy. If you consider the dark energy to be due to the cosmological constant, I'm going to go over that then um, the scalar tensor series of relativity can explain that differently. It depends on what, how you uh, take into account dark energy. What is dark energy? But dark matter is definitely you can make a point that should be there, and then you get over 1. So anyway, so there are two things that are close to 1. 0.5, yes, and this one. Is the fact that the universe has a smaller potential um, than the black hole due to the dark energy, or is it because there's a singularity to the black hole? The, the, fa the, the fact that uh, the, the so large for a black hole, it has to do that the, there is so the, uh, much uh, mass and gravitation there that is the limit, right? And uh, the interesting thing is, why is the universe close to one? And I was saying that the simple thing, after so much astronomical observations, is still around one. So it's, there, seems to, there seems to be something real here, because uh, it has many things have gone by the wayside and defenestrated, but this is still close to one. But I remember, the mega drive is close to zero. Let's plot this, because I can put numbers, and one doesn't have a sense of what, for what this is. Here we have a logarithmic scale. Log that means each of these increments is a factor of 10. This is 1 times 10 to the minus 27. This is 1. Look at where the mega drive is here. It's here, it's practically 0. Nothing here. Okay? The next thing, the uh, air surface, the, uh, s uh, the potential from the sun at the Earth's orbit, the potential from the uh, sun at the sun's surface, the potential from the Milky Way at our Earth's location, all of them here. And then you make a jump to go to the black hole, which is approximately the same as the total universe, calculating ordinary matter, um, the, the event horizon, and this based on the critical density from WMAP. If you Again, calculate, include dark energy, then you have a little bump here, but from the point of view of a logarithmic scale, it doesn't matter. Okay, so that's confusion number one. Confusion number two, where is the Woodward effect? Last year, there were two papers at the Estes conference trying to find the Woodward effect in general relativity. And these two papers, wrote, again, they didn't make any distinction between lowercase phi and uppercase phi, 
by this, this particular paper, for example, made a big point. The whole paper was that the Wilbur effect was already in general relativity and actually was contained in this term, which is the wave operator. And it is said that, that the second time derivative of the local potential, which is the, the wave operator, was the Wilbur effect. No, that's wrong. That's not the Wilbur effect. And actually, uh, it said that everything uh, followed from there. Why is that not the Wilbur effect? Because Jim himself wrote this equation, where you have the wave operator here, and he didn't consider this to be the Wilbur effect. The Wilbur effect were these extra terms that are added to this. So, where is the Wilbur effect and why is it not here? Well, number one is because Jim, when he defined the Wilbur effect, he considered the Dallenbergian instead of considering the Laplacian, which is what those two papers from the other conference did last year. So therefore, that already is, is against what Jim defined as the Wilbur effect. But more importantly, there are more important reasons. Why is it that this, this cannot be anything that is Machian? It cannot be the Wilbur effect. There is something fundamental. And Jim did the right thing by not uh, considering this to be the Wilbur effect. Because if you set this equal to zero, that means if you have a, uh, a universe with no mass, or if you consider a space-time where there are no sources, right, this wave operator of the, lo of the local potential, and you set the whole thing equal to zero, you have so-called vacuum solutions. Vacuum solutions meaning solutions of general relativity for which there is no mass. In technical terms, because the Ricci curvature is what appears in general relativity, it means that it's Ricci flat. And the reason why you still have solutions, even though the, cur the Ricci curvature is zero, is because what matters is the Riemann curvature, and the Riemann curvature can still be non-zero. The important thing is that there have been long discussions about the, uh, the Machian effect, and it turns out that general relativity is agnostic as far as the Machian effect. General relativity has solutions that respect the Mach effect. For uh, the uh, most important of them, probably the Friedman uh, Walken uh, Robertson solution. But it has solutions that are very anti Machian. Number one was the one presented to Einstein in, during his 70th birthday by uh, Gödel. It was his uh, birthday uh, gift that uh, Einstein really hated because he showed <laughs> that you, if you have a rotating universe, which is uh, very anti machian to start with, you can have uh, closed time loops and all kinds of problems. So uh, Einstein really hated the solution and he, to find out that his theory could have such a horrible solution. But in the, around the 1960, uh, Shukin with his student Osbas, and I, who Shukin was a, a student of uh, Jordan, I'm going to be talking about later on, came back with something even more powerful because there are many vacuum solutions. Most important of them is the Schwarzschild solution. But the thing with those most vacuum solutions is they have singularities, like the Schwarzschild solution. So people usually say, well, the Schwarzschild solution is a vacuum solution, but there is a mass that is hiding be uh, behind that singularity. The Schuking and Osbach came up with a solution that was singularity free. And yet, uh, it was a vacuum solution, and that completely demolished any hope that general relativity is Machian. General relativity can have solutions that are Machian. It can have solutions that are very anti-Machian. And um, when we talk about uh, gravitational waves, these are like disturbances, actually, if you take into account the, the time source here that are taking place without any source. OK, confusion number three. We cannot have a one-dimensional model for Mach propulsion. Why? First of all, you cannot have a clamp boundary condition in space. There is nothing to clamp to. You can clamp something here to terra firma. To, and you can describe maybe your experiment, your uh, mega drive experiment with a clamp here. You cannot clamp it out there. 
Most importantly, you cannot I hear all this push pull. If you to push pull, you can do here because I have friction and I cannot go into slide. But how can I push on something in space? I I, I have to have something to rely on. So if I if I have only one dimensional object, I cannot do that. You cannot push or pull something with besides with internal forces, like we were talking about the E and drive, like you very well said. How can you have any, any acceleration of the center of mass due to any internal forces. No, that's, that, that, it doesn't matter whether it's electric friction, piezoelectricity, uh, V cross B, or whatever. It's a violation of conservation of momentum. A 1D fluctuating mass will not accelerate in any direction. Confusion number four. We cannot have changes in mass due to energy fluctuations without damping. Take a simple pendulum or a, a simple single degree of freedom oscillator where, let's say, you have this mass spring and you have it clamped. Single degree of freedom. The total energy, if you don't consider damping, doesn't change. The, it is uh, trivial to show that the potential energy uh, plus the kinetic energy is constant. Both of them gravitate. There is no reason to pick one over the other. You, it's there, uh, therefore, the, the total energy, which is what matters from the point of view of general relativity, is constant. The on, so how can you have a fluctuation? In order to have a fluctuation, you have to have damping. When you have damping, actually, because it, energy is escaping, there, there are actually one can show that the solution looks like this, and you have a time varying term that is proportional here to gamma. This, this guy defined it as being two times the critical damping times the natural frequency. And if this is zero, zero damping, then you, then you then the thing decays here like a decaying exponential, and you don't have any fluctuation. To have a fluctuation, you have to have damping. It is a very interesting thing in this experiment which is not as trivial as people think, that in order to have the fluctuation, you have to have damping. But if you have too much damping, then you're going to be in trouble. So the, the, the uh, solution and uh, what's going on is not as trivial as people think, as well, first sight. Number five, models that ignore damping cannot realistically predict frequency omega dependence. I hear, oh, this is going to go like omega six. No, it's going to go like omega to the fourth. No, it's going to go like omega to the third. And they're not taking into account damping. They are doing experiments at resonance, not away from resonance. Like you said very well yesterday, if you are here or if you are here, then you can ignore damping and it doesn't matter. But where they're doing the experiment is right here, at resonance. At resonance, if you don't take into account damping, the amplitude is infinite. In order to have a, a finite value, you have to have a damping. And the greater the damping, the smaller the amplitude. So again, this is very interesting. On one hand, I have to have dam damping in order to have an energy fluctuation. But if I have too much damping, then my amplitude is going to be small. So actually, there is a sweet spot of, of damping as far as uh, in order to have the most energy fluctuation that you can find. Again, no damping, infinite amplitude, absurd. It's unphysical, to, therefore, to predict omega-6, omega-4, omega square. I don't care the, when you're ignoring damping and resonance. There is heat generation, which is a function of frequency. The greater the frequency, the more heat generation you're going to have. And as you very well showed in your analysis yesterday, if you take into account the structural damping, the higher modes are going to be more heavily damped. Therefore, how can you be predicting omega-6 and anything like that when you're not taking into account damping? Doesn't make sense. Number six, confusion. Mass fluctuations predictions that are incompatible with physical experimental data. This is a prediction where the author I, I, uh, did a great thing here. I love it. This is honesty. He said the amplitude of the mass fluctuation is close to 0.4 milligrams, which is a huge value. I agree, it's a huge value. It doesn't make sense. The mass fluctuation has to be compatible with existing dyna uh, dynamic physical data. This value doesn't make sense. Why? 
You don't go and measure this with a scale. It wouldn't make any sense. You're, you're having here a fluctuation that going, let's say, at 35, 38 kilohertz. So why do I say that this doesn't make any sense? What experiment can you, can you make? Well, number one, if you have a mass fluctuation, it's going to change the frequency. It's also going to change the dynamics. You can, you can measure that very easily. Yesterday, I asked when somebody was representing the EM drive, I saw a Q equal to 500,000. Oh, my god. Well, actually, uh, for particle accelerators, you can have with superconducting cavities, you can have 10, 10 million, right? But you know that the delta F, the bandwidth of the frequency, goes like 1 over Q. So if you tell me that you can measure Q of 1 million, it means that you can measure a delta F of 1 divided by 1 million. And here you have a mega drive, right, that is measuring, let's, uh, has a mass, let's say, of uh, 0.1 kilograms, and, you, and you're saying it has a, an amplitude of close to 0.4 milligrams, you should be able to, me to uh, measure this as a disturbance on the natural frequency, and actually even better, if you take into do the equations, you can uh, do it as a disturbance on the dynamics. And this is very well studied, and it doesn't make sense. This mass fluctuation is too large, and the, and the author gets commendations for recognizing that. Number seven. Mechanical energy is not the only type of energy that gravitates or that has a gravitational potential. In, in order to be able to match the experimental results, the author had to go to an extreme length of saying that what mattered for some magical reason was the mechanical energy and nothing else matters. But that goes against the theory we are trying to use, which is general relativity. In general relativity, all types of energy momentum gravitate. Stress energy gravitates, yes, but kinetic energy gravitates. It is extremely important. When we look at the, at the binary uh, black hole or binary neutron gravitational wave, etc., you have to take into account the kinetic energy, of course. Thermal energy gravitates. And the electromagnetic energy, actually, this, uh, uh, the stress uh, tensor due to electromagnetic energy, this term is the energy density, this uh, turns here at the pointing vector, and this is the Maxwell st uh, stress tensor. That gravitates. What, what you could do, maybe, is like Hohn and Arlikar did, is to put a factor, because they use a factor of lambda, saying, well, maybe the part of electromagnetic could, for reasons, for example, like the photon has no mass, Maybe that has a different effect, but you cannot have initio saying that uh, these types of energy don't gravitate. Uh, the electromagnetic energy, actually, if it's large enough, you can even calculate the, the, the stresses and the deflections. In this case, for example, 0.15 millimeters, purely due to electromagnetic uh, energy. Now, confusion number eight, and we're coming to the end of the confusions. <laughs> in whole Nalika theory, there is a little m. And I first saw that and said, oh, that little m, that's, that's, that is the local source mass. But then I went to look into this and this, no, that's not the local source mass at all. It is not, it is not the local source mass. It is, if you go into whole Nalika theory, again, where is, where is the, the mass? The mass is here in T, in the stress energy density tensor. It is not here. This little m is not mass. And therefore, these are not exactly the, what uh, Jim uh, derived. Although it looks like that way, and I'm going to, see, to show you why it looks that way, and, and actually you can do something with it. The mass is here, but m is not a mass. If you use the smooth field uh, version of Holner Likas, which is what the only, the only Holner-Likert theory that uh, Heidi has written about the equations is a smooth field version of it. And if you use that one, this scalar field that is, is a field that is pervading all of space-time and is associated with a particle that has zero mass. So not only m is not the local mass, 
It doesn't even have a mass. It's massless. M is only due to the inverse square root of G. M goes like 1 over the square root of G. That's it. And then you have C, the, the speed of light, and 2. They don't matter. What is M? M is 1 over the square root of G. If, you, if it this help you, the Planck mass also goes like 1 over square root of G. But what, what that is, is a field pervading space. Yes? It has units of square root of force. It has the units of a square root of mass. C to the sorry, power. sorry, sorry. It has units of the square root of force. Yes, sorry. It goes like the square root of G. Uh, however, um, Jürgen Ehlers wrote, uh, wrote that, that he strongly doubted that the whole analytical particle field theory has any mathematical solution. So actually, it, it, uh, one can show that uh, leads to mathematical divergences. That's why whenever you were, people are going to talk about Holner Likert, they're going, uh, which is a particle field theory, nobody has any solutions for it. None. And to me, uh, uh, physics is not just posing an equation. It's having solutions to the equation that then match experiments. The only version of Holner Likert that has uh, any possible solution is the smooth field. And Jürgen Ehlers very well said that maybe the Holland and Likert theory can only be taken seriously, and he told that to, uh, to Hoyle and Likert at the conference in 1995, after you have gone to the fluid average. The fluid average version of Holland and Likert actually is a conformal scalar tensor gravity theory that had been uh, done before Holland and Likert had that theory. It was done before by uh, Brans and Dickey, and before Brans and Dickey, it was uh, done by a great German, Jordan, Pascual Jordan, who is uh, famous for his work on quantum mechanics. He has a book from 1951, and actually what Jordan did, was, it was in German, it was much better than what was done later on by Brans and Dickey, as I'm going to show. It's a more general theory. Anyway, uh, this Jordan Brans Dickey theory is much more studied. It has several exact solutions. And is derivable, actually, from Kaluza-Klein cosmology. Actually, uh, when Jordan uh, first derived it, he embedded a curved four-dimensional space-time into a five-dimensional uh, flat spa uh, space-time. And it, since then, it has been derived from Kaluza-Klein cosmology and even from string theory. And actually, I'm showing this here, that, uh, that uh, string theory also shows the scalar field, and it comes out completely without, the, without assuming anything about Max principle or anything like that, and uh, it comes automatically. And when Jordan also came up with his theory, he didn't uh, assume anything about Max principle. But the ones that assume Max principle were Branson Dickey and Holland and Likert. The important thing is that in the Jordan Branson Dickey theory, there's a coupling constant that I'm going to be talking later on that is responsible for the experiments being uh, much more than what one will predict. And in holner likert this coupling constant is not there, and there should be one. In any case, holner likert fluid version theory is, is, a, is a scalar tensor theory that uh, is contained within Jordan's theory anyway. So, Let's say, yes. Uh, are we going to get into confusion in terms with uh, using uh, omega as a frequency as well as this coupling constant? Uh, this, this is uh, people in, uh, this has been used uh, for a long, uh, all the people that are familiar with scalar tensor theory and cosmology know what omega is, so I can not do anything about that. Unfortunately, there, is, uh, two, uh, there are much more physicists, and physicists have much more theories, and their theories contain many more parameters than there are letters in the alphabet. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, <laughs> Let, let, let me, let me uh, let continue with this. The field equations of Brans Dickey's theory, to compare with uh, Holner Likert's, it has the Einstein tensor here, which contains the curvature, the stress energy tensor that contains uh, ma the mass density, and then you have the scalar field here, um, uh, phi. Phi is the scalar field. The interesting thing is, as you know, 
All this theory is to be well derived, starting with Hilbert when he derived the Lagrangian for general relativity, start with the Lagrangian. And when Jordan derived his theory, he included the scal uh, scalar tensor field in the Lagrangian uh, matter term. But Brands and Dickey uh, realized that that violates the weak equivalence principle. So they took it out of there. And uh, Brands and Dickey have the uh, a scalar field outside. There is no scalar field inside T. So how does the scalar field in Holner Licker or in Jordan Brands Dickey, how does it couple with matter, which is what we're interested in for the mega drive? It's, it couples through this scalar equation, which is the wave operator of the local potential equals the stress energy tensor that has the matter and it's divided by 3 plus 2 omega, where omega is the coupling uh, factor. So as omega goes to infinity, this becomes zero, and you lose all the coupling to the stress energy tensor. That's where uh, omega comes in. So the larger omega is, the less coupling there is between the scalar field and matter. The smaller the omega is, the better. The larger it is, the less of an effect you're going to see. And the, it also appears here. Now, the problem is that uh, Dickey, uh, the MIT guy, was very interested in experiments. And he was not only happy with when Brands came up with his theory, he, he had a program which was very intense in the 1960s to verify whether there were such deviations from general relativity. And since then, there have been... Excuse me, I think he was at Princeton, not MIT. But he was an MIT guy from an education point of view. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you're right. He was, he was at, at Princeton just like Brands. Yeah. So, and that's how Brands uh, uh, commingled his ideas with uh, Dickey. But for, I, I, I say that Dickey was very interested in experiments, uh, much more interested than Brands was. And Dickey was the, was the force behind all these experiments. And then uh, Shapiro at MIT came up with the experiments that constrain this omega. And it turns out now the latest experiment is the Cassini-Huygens um, probe that uh, shows that the coupling parameter omega, remember the larger omega it, it is, the less the coupling of the scalar field. And fortunately, it shows that omega is greater than 43,000. Brands and Dickey hope that the scalar field was going to be, of, uh, omega was going to be about 1. 43,000 is bad. It means that the effect is very small. So, however, there is uncertainty on scalar coupling in interstellar space. All these experiments, the uh, ones conducted by Shapiro, the latest one from Cassini-Huygens, etc., are mostly experiments about the solar system. The ones that show that omega is quite large, 40, now, nowadays over 43,000, are measurements within the solar system. There is hope because of measurements for interstellar space. And there is a a uh, guy at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, Corey, that came up with this chameleon theory uh, that also had been applied to this uh, scalar tensor uh, field, saying that perhaps in inter the, the omega is large because of the local potential from the sun or the boys around here, and interstellar space is actually maybe a further one. Well, what was that the literature show? There are mainly two main papers that appear on PRD. One, in 2004, it was not very hopeful. Uh, Nagata and company using uh, WMAP temperature power spectrum constraints had, has omega going between 10 to 10 to the 7, quite, quite a range. And this, this number here, 10 to the 7, is huge. So uh, that didn't look very hopeful at all. Fortunately, in 2014, more recently, Crixina, using distance supernova type 1a and the Hubble function measurements, I had to say that using Bayesian uh, methods, uh, so uh, take that into account, 
found that omega, however, uh, based on the supernova type 1a, has, is between minus 0.86 and minus 2.38, which is very large coupling. And this is very interesting because it's correspondence with the low energy limit that is predicted by string theory. Remember, string theory also predicts this scalar field completely independently from anything that Brands Dickey did. It comes out automatically. And according to string theory, omega should be minus 1. And it's very interesting that these measurements show it to be about minus 1 in interstellar space, not, not in the solar system. What is the meaning of the sign of omega being negative? If you see here, as, as omega goes to infinity, then you get uh, four thirds. As, uh, if you have omega equal to, uh, sorry, if omega is equal to zero, you have four thirds. If omega goes to infinity, you get uh, one here, two divided by two. If omega is equal to minus one, then in the, the, in the numerator we have four minus two, you get two divided by three minus two, which is one, therefore I get the factor of two. So it's this, it's this factor right here. So, uh, on, yes, uh, on the possibility of omega being negative, ranging between negative 2 and negative 0.86, what, have, what physical intuition do we have for the singularity that occurs at omega equal negative 3 halves, where there is infinite coupling between 5 and t? I don't, uh, I don't, the, the, the fact that uh, Dickey uh, uh, experimental program and then continued by Shapiro and so on, or re found right away that omega was quite large, that has gone up to omega over 43,000, okay? Uh, uh, if, you look, if you see, for example, what Clifford Will has to say, he says, uh, Clifford Will will say that, uh, that uh, this has disproven the scalar tensor series as being any practical theory. So you have to take into account then that the whole mainstream of people in general relativity say, well, a scalar tensor theory was a nice theory that was disproven by experiments. It's only lately that uh, Corey came up with a chameleon effect, and then people started looking at space and whether in space it could, it could be uh, larger. And then a string theory coming up with equal to minus one is also discounted by the fact that number one, that the particle associated with it is called a dilaton, uh, it's, it's a completely, um, it's a particle that, uh, 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 that of course, there's no hope of any experimental validation uh, within our lifetime. S uh, and uh, if you ask about string theory, people nowadays are very discouraged. So it, it, the answer to your question is that people don't seriously consider that question. What I can tell you is that the Afara singularities if we go back to the, this equation, the, the way that it was posed by Brands and Dickey is not very nice because if phi is equal to zero, it appears that you have a singularity here. And actually, that's not a singularity. That is a, that's a bad way in which Brands and Dickey wrote these equations. Holland and Likert doesn't have this, in, this uh, M field in the, in the denominator. It appears in the numerator. If you go uh, back to... Um, to Jordan, you can make a transformation actually, where and as actually people working on this nowadays, like Fuji in Japan, uh, where you you get rid of uh, phi in the in the denominator by a transformation, and actually there is no singularity due to the scalar field. So That's just, just in nutshell, can you explain why omega should vary in space? Because of the chameleon field, it's because it is being uh, shielded by the energy uh, density, the background energy density. Uh, Can you explain to us what is the chameleon effect? The chameleon effect is uh, the idea that you can have, for example, uh, the scalar uh, field and the scalar uh, 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 tensor series that is uh, uh, showing uh, as having much smaller coupling uh, when you are next to uh, something that has a, a relatively large potential like the sun or, or, or anything like that. But if you are, if you are in, in interstellar space, 
you would not and, and you are away from any close source you would not have uh, that effect and therefore it would appear as a true coupling which should be equal to minus one according to string theory and essentially saying that the coupling should be minus one in interstellar space where you have masses very far away but if you have a mass near you or energy near you then then that coupling becomes much smaller well <clears throat> interstellar space still has the mass of the galaxy nearby but they are far away this is the proximity that, that oh, uh, the proximity. Is the pro this, uh, the, it has it has to do with the proximity so, Jose, does, does the Earth have any kind of commuting field then? Or? Yes. The, uh, but, uh, and the, actually, I have to say that it's a great marketing, uh, <laughs> the chameleon uh, 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 word and so on is a great marketing uh, thing because people have been writing about it before uh, Corey did, and uh, uh, people are still not using it. For, for example, other people like uh, Suskin and so on, they're not using the word chameleon. So. Uh, anyway, it's, 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 a, it's a word that has caught on just for the fact that the um, that uh, some for a coupling uh, the coupling should uh, depend on the distance to uh, a gravitational source. Remember that also uh, this is also strange because is there any e experimental evidence for the so-called chameleon effect? No, no, not yet. But actually, uh, JPL. Uh, has a, a, a NASA grant, just like ours, uh, by proposal. NIAC uh, for, uh, uh, approved uh, phase one proposal for doing a test of something inside and outside a space vessel. For, for the chameleon effect. And, and, and there are, they are experiments. Could you repeat that, uh, John? I couldn't hear you. The, you put uh, this, this uh, NASA grant for uh, NIAC, just like uh, us, we have an, a NIAC grant for the Mega Drive. Uh -huh. There's a NIAC uh, grant, phase one, to conduct an experiment between the Earth and the Moon, having uh, space probes, one where you have an experiment that is shielded and one where it is unshielded. One's inside the space vehicle <coughs> and the other's outside the space vehicle, and you can look at the differential effect between the two. Oh, why should there be any effect? Mm -hmm. I don't in, in, some, in some some versions of the uh, there are many versions of the chameleon effect and some versions some versions of the chameleon effect uh, it, it looks like it will be measurable whether it is shielded or unshielded. If you want to get away from the sun's effects, how many AU out do you have to go before you're uh, in, a, in a region where you don't have to worry about the sun anymore? Uh, I think it had to be. Uh, um, um, Away from uh, the Oort cloud by uh, by uh, yeah. by a factor. Outside the Oort cloud. Yes. So wow. that's uh, two two sevenths of a light year. Okay. Yeah. So uh, so anyway, uh, this <laughs> <laughs> there there are also experiments being conducted uh, uh, in labs throughout the world to try to show the chameleon effect, not just in uh, on the Earth. Yes, on the Earth. Yes. Oh. There may be one in Berkeley. Oh. Actually. Okay. Uh, so finally, uh, confusion number nine. Repeating the Wheeler's uh, mantra of mass energy there, rules inertia here. Actually, in our uh, NIA grant, I saw that we had that in our poster. And I saw, well, there's a big problem with, with this. So capital Phi goes like, uh, let's say, use a coefficient of one here. Uh, capital G times the mass of the universe divided by the radius of the universe. The mass of the universe is 10 to the 53 kilograms. One, zero, 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 a huge number. This mass is out there, 10 to the 53 kilograms, rules the inertia here. But here you're only fluctuating this tiny mass, which is 0.2 kilograms. And if you want to change the inertia of this tiny mass, instead of fluctuating this tiny mass, you should be, if you believe this, mass energy there rules inertia here, and I want to change the inertia here, I should be fluctuating the mass of the, uh, of the objects that are responsible for the inertia that is out there. Of course, you have no hope to fluctuate those things, and that's why Jimmy fluctuated this one here, 
But when people also they put this, uh, repeat this, mass energy there rules energy here, it's a contradiction with what one is doing because we're not fluctuating the mass energy out there, which is ruling the inertia here. We're trying to change the inertia here by fluctuating the mass here. The contradiction with this, what is being said here, like a mantra. People are not thinking about what uh, when when we're putting this here, what what that means. So, correct formulation. <laughs> Number one, can can we find uh, the Wilbur effect terms in acting general relativity? So. I, even though uh, I know very well that this is all a case of what is the overall cosmological solution for uh, the uh, uh, general relativity, let's say that you take a solution that is Machian, like the uh, Friedman Robertson Walker. So it is a, a kind of a Machian cosmological solution. Is there a term like the uh, Wilbur term in general relativity? And actually, I found uh, that there is uh, a term that goes like the local fee, not the, not the capital fee, it's the local potential times the second derivative of the local potential with respect to time. The problem is that the prefactor is not the capital G, it's the, it's the small case G, is what appears there. And if you calculate this, this term is of order third post-Newtonian. You know, each post-Newtonian term it goes by a factor of c squared. This is a very, very, very small term. It's 3pn. So again, uh, it's not going to give you much hope using this term for getting uh, even micronewtons from fluctuating the mass. So this, although this term is there, it's not helpful to explain experiments. It's infinitesimal because, and because the factor, the prefactor is uh, lowercase fee, it is not the universe potential, which is about one. And there's another problem in, in general relativity that even though you find this term, as you know, general relativity has gauge dependence, therefore coordinate dependence, therefore what you mean by that term is also you have to be very careful. And, uh, and then lastly, but uh, you have to take this into account, the physical meaning of such a term is tied to the solution uh, the overall cosmological solution because you can have anti machian cosmologies. So, another, the way that I found that 3pn term is um, um, looking actually at the lambda Lipschitz uh, formulation, which is actually quite nice, uh, you can find it. But the, the, using that, uh, you're doing a perturbation. It is actually found the solution using the Bianchi identities, which is uh, more complex uh, it's very nice because if you use the Bianchi identities, you can find this relationship, which act is actually useful for gravitational waves. Instead of having the Ricci tensor, you have the full uh, Riemannian tensor, and you have the wave operator on the Riemannian tensor, and that, instead of being uh, proportional to the stress energy tensor, is proportional to the second derivative of the stress energy tensor. So it's already there. <laughs> However, I, uh, I have not gotten very far, and I, there's not much hope because, again, dealing with the, uh, it's, it's difficult enough dealing with the Ricci tensor, dealing with the Riemannian uh, uh, tensor is, is much, much larger, we have much more components, and you have the previous problems of gauge dependence and so on. So, enough of that. Hey, wait, uh, yes. Lance Williams tried to do the same thing as far as looking at I showed that what Max Williams did, uh, that was completely wrong. Let me, finish the Let me finish the question. Okay. Um, what is the difference between what you're proposing and what Lance has done? What he did was completely wrong. Number one, he... <laughs> I, I want to say it again. Number one, what the term he's finding goes completely against what Jim found. Because what, what Jim defined the terms so, uh, was considering that term not being the uh, Woodward term. The Woodward term are other terms. It's not that. It is in the original paper by Jim. Number two, let's say that Jim will be wrong. Let's say that he will insist, no, that is the, Woodward, that, that is the uh, Woodward term. It cannot be because if you have the stress energy tensor equal to zero, that means that there is no mass, what he's saying then is that you have a Machian term 
that is due to no mass. And that is a violation of Mach's principle of the largest order. Because <laughs> according to Mach, every, everything uh, is due to the mass energy. Therefore, it's completely wrong from every point of view that you can look at it. So not right, you'd say. <laughs> Got it? Bad. 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 It doesn't make sense. It's not even wrong. <laughs> it's not even wrong. OK. So, correct formulation, a scalar tensor series. Although, you know, we're here in the United States, Brands Dickey and so on, and, and uh, Heidegger like Holland and Licker. actually here the, the, the t uh, towering figure was Jordan that did everything before and I did it better. Uh, but anyway, so Brands Dickey came up with this separately, trying to use a, a Mackian approach. And then Holner Licker later on came up with another one. And I don't think that they, it looked like they never quite realized, at least at the beginning, that what they were doing was really Brands Dickey's uh, theory. At least I haven't found the paper where it acknowledged that. But it's really the same. So if we look at uh, Holner Licker uh, theory, where you remember m is not the local mass, it's a scalar field that goes like 1 over square root of g. If you um, actually uh, do um, a contraction and you get the uh, scalar field equation, you have the scalar rigid tensor, uh, the scalar stress energy tensor, and very simply, you have the wave operator on the a scalar field divided by the, the scalar field itself. All the nonlinear terms disappear, and this is completely valid for uh, nonlinear, absolutely nonlinear. I have not done any, you can do this a contraction without invoking um, a, a small gravitation or any, any perturbation. This is fully, fully general, and actually, that this, that this equation applies. There is a similar equation also in the Brantic theory. Anyway, this, uh, if you set this term equal to 0, uh, this equation, that means the wave operator on the scalar field plus the scalar uh, Ricci uh, curvature, you uh, can see even from Colin Arica in 1974, before string theory, they already pointed out that this could be interpreted as giving rise to particles that were companions to gravitons called dilatons. And in string theory, actually completely separately, this term, this particle, has appeared as a scalar field, and it's a closed string, it's massless, so the graviton is also a closed string and it's massless, but because it comes from a scalar field, it spins zero, while a graviton is spin two. Now, the why it's called dilaton? It's called dilaton bec because this comes from dilatational invariance. It's a scalar field, so you have like dilatation. It's isotropic in all directions. That's why it's called dilaton. So it is a companion particle to the graviton that will be responsible for this scalar field. And uh, you have to take into account that are not the gravitons. It's a, it's a separate particle. I was interested to see what happens if you put a cosmological constant here. If you put a cosmological constant, it comes as another term. Here is a cosmological constant that is additive to the wave operator on the scalar field. If I put numbers here, then I like to compute what is the uh, relationship bet uh, between the scalar field wave operator, that means the fluctuation we're going to be doing for the Woodward experiment, compared to the cosmological constant. Is it larger or smaller? How much larger does it have to be? The cosmological constant is so small that actually, uh, in order for this term to be larger than the cosmological constant, all you need is to have that the second derivative with respect to time of the, the scalar field times c squared has to be larger than 7 and 10 to the minus 36, which is 1 over second square, which is an extremely small number. In other words, the cosmological constant doesn't matter. It's extremely small. It's much smaller than anything we will be talking about in the Woodward experiment. Forget about the cosmological constant. It, it's nice that it appears there, but it, it is so small 
that uh, it, it does not play a role, and you cannot say that the Woodward experiments are due to dark energy. This dark energy is too small. Dark energy, anyway, it makes sense because dark energy it doesn't matter for a very small scale. It should only matter for a very large scale, and so it, it, does, it doesn't make sense. So forget about the cosmological constant. If we do um, a, now a perturbation analysis on the horner likert theory, and we get this equation with the local potential phi. This is a term that um, you were asking me that somebody was saying that it was a Mackin effect. No, it's not. And this is the term we're interested in, which is the, the right-hand side, like uh, what Jim was considering. There, there are the terms on the right-hand side. And you consider that, um, again, according to the scalar tensor theory, this is an idea that came originally from Dirac, that the gravitational uh, constant should not be constant. It should be a function of time. It, it also could be a function of position. S but uh, unfortunately, uh, there are experiments that, again, showing that uh, it, the, uh, it is, if it is a function of time, it, it, it's an extremely small function of time. So consider that the gravitational constant could be uh, additive, for example, to a term that is constant and a term that uh, is uh, dependent on the frequency. And then this, uh, consider the, the second derivative with respect to time. We're interested in that because of the Woodward effect. Remember, it is the second derivative with respect to time of the energy fluctuation. Uh, is dependent on the gravitational constant like this. In other words, is the second derivative of the gravitational constant divided by the gravitational constant. So the experiments that are, look bad are the ones that were started actually by Shapiro again. I think it was the, the Viking experiment uh, that showed, um, anyway, based on, uh, on, on observations of planets, they have, been sh they have been constraints at the beginning. They were like uh, the variation of G with, uh, uh, with respect to time divided by G was uh, uh, like uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago was already 10 to the minus 10. Uh, the latest thing, for example, by Pincheva and Pinchev in 2013 shows it to be 10 to the minus 21 over 1 over second, extremely small. Exactly. So I point, so if you do this, I uh, have this uh, paper that's under review, uh, and you consider that there's a, a term that is proportional to the frequency, then, and if you take into account the data from the variable white dwarf that uh, uh, where, uh, that actually this is one of the most precise uh, natural clocks in the universe, this, uh, this white dwarf. Uh, this, the, the present bound is uh, 10 to the minus 17. But the frequency of uh, this natural uh, white dwarf is quite low. If you take into account that the experiments that Jim is conducted are at 35 kilohertz, then the uncertainty is much larger. I came up, then, then based on this and the frequency, that would tell me that this term, which has got to do with how small our measure forces are going to be, could be between 0 and 10 to the minus 5. Remember, I, I got a factor of 10 to the minus 6, so uh, between my calculations and the experiment. So uh, this there's still uh, room for hope. This is, our, this is actually the white dwarf that acts like a uh, clock. It's quite interesting. So having, that, having gone over the general relativity and scalar tensor theory, it is very interesting to go back to Siama. And it turns out that I can kind of obtain the correct term from Siama using simple differentiation. Yes, Siama, you were right here. Uh, he made a difference between the universe total potential capital phi and the, lo and the local potential lower uh, case phi. So uh, the, the universe total potential, remember that it can be have a factor of three half, one, something, I don't care. Let's call it C. That's, that's a constant there. Times the gravitational constant times the mass of the universe divided by the radius of the universe. 
If I take the second derivative of this with respect to time, I'm not going to be changing the mass of the universe. I'm not going to be changing the radius of the observable universe. Those are constants. Therefore, it is the second derivative of the gravitational constant divided by the gravitational constant. And then this factor is equal to phi. So it really doesn't matter what c is. It doesn't matter whether it's 3 half, 1, it has, that, that is completely irrelevant. The second derivative with respect to time of capital phi is equal to f the total universe, which is, this is about 1, times g by double dot divided by g. Let's look at the local potential. The local potential, you have the gravitational constant, you have the local mass, and you have divided by the distance r from the local mass. All of those, let's consider them to be functions of time. Then you can get this equation that the second derivative of the local potential with respect to time is equal to the local potential times uh, g double dot divided by g times the second derivative of the mass, the local mass with respect to time. And then if you sum them up, like uh, uh, Siama did, his, uh, because you had to sum both of them up, and you look at the second derivative with respect to time of the universe potential plus the local potential, you get the total potential of the universe times g double dot over g plus the local potential times the second derivative with respect to time of the local mass. So the term that is due to the fluctuation of the local mass still is multiplied by the local potential. Again, remember the mass energy out there is responsible for the inertia here. So I'm not going to be, by changing the, the mass here, I'm only going to have a self-effect, which is extremely small. So all these terms are extremely small. This is the term we're interested in, the one that, has, that is multiplied by um, uppercase phi. This term actually is the one that appears in the scalar tensor series. It appears in honnard lickel theory, it appears in Jordan theory, in brandt dickel theory, it appears in string theory. It is the term that is mediated by the uh, dilaton and is related to the fluctuation of G. This is the term where we have the hope of explaining what Jim has been measuring. And these terms are the terms that appear in general relativity but they are extremely small because they are related to the local potential in order to extremely small. Yes. <clears throat> to what extent have the scalar tensor theories been ruled out by the recent uh, LIGO, the Virgo observations? I think that what uh, has been ruled out is the idea that uh, Fuji uh, from Japan had, which uh, uh, said that the reason why the coupling constant uh, for the scalar tensor theory could be small is because the dilaton could be acquiring a mass and therefore there will be a fifth force that will be due to this effect and it will be a short range force. And the reason why it would not have been found in the solar system measurement is because they deal with the, the ray, with uh, lens that are too large, for example the orbit of Mercury and the other planets, and uh, they, they, this effect could be a short range force. But this is being ruled out by experiment because if the dilaton acquires a mass, then there should be uh, a, a, a gravitational wave due to the dilaton that should be traveling at a, a, a speed uh, that is different than the speed of light, that is lower than the speed of light, and that has been ruled out. Mm -hmm. Therefore, to me, the, the idea of Fuji of the dilaton acquiring a mass, which has some ideas based on quantum mechanics, is being ruled out. And the one that survives is the chameleon theory and its string theory, because in a string theory, the dilaton doesn't have a mass. If it doesn't have a mass, then it's traveling at the speed of light. And the, if the energy that is uh, associated with the gravitational waves due to the dilaton are much, much uh, small, the, smaller than the one due to the gravitons. We already have a uh, paint stake in being able to measure the gravitational wave due to, so that it survives. So anyway, it's interesting that one can derive uh, uh, all these uh, dependencies uh, simply just from Siama. So what the reason for the large discrepancy with experimental results, I say, is that mass energy there rules inertia here, 
and you you are not fluctuating the the mass energy there you are fluctuating the mass energy here which is extremely small and that is the reason why the experiments including the older experiments that uh, Martin looked at the were electromagnetic uh, were giving forces that are much much smaller so uh, if I still have a few minutes or not Okay, so uh, remember that last year I had a solution for the uh, Woodward effect on the mega drive based on a two degree of freedom system. I say that it doesn't make sense to have a one degree of freedom system. I was not quite happy with uh, that solution because it, um, it involves when you have a mass of the brass a spring and then you have the mass of the aluminum then uh, you have to decide the, the piezoelectric plates have a mass and then you have to decide to apportion the mass in the two degree of freedom model some of the mass of the piezoelectric plates to the brass to, to the left mass and some of the mass to the right mass and that seemed uh, was un uncomfortable with that so I explore uh, getting an exact solution for the uh, piezoelectric stack uh, uh, using partial uh, differential equation as a continuous system. So I, I was able to do this uh, in the complex plane and this allows me now to have a, a solution which is analytical that uh, has all the modes because you have a continuous system so you have an infinite number of modes. Before with a two degree of freedom system you had only uh, one mode which was this. I couldn't tell the other, the other thing I couldn't tell you what's going on in the second mode, the third mode, and so on. Now I have an infinite number of modes. And uh, it would take me a long time show you, showing you the results. Uh, I still have a discrepancy with the, uh, with the experiment, which uh, is, is between uh, a factor of 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6, depending on a number of variables. And I say that there is a very good reason for that discrepancy, which is the reasons I gave you before. So, uh, the other thing that uh, I get by having an exact solution for the piezoelectric plates using uh, a partial differential equation instead of the two degree of freedom model is that I can model now damping, uh, taking into account structural damping, hysterectic damping, fluid damping, any kind of damping. I want to put in the equation. While if you are doing the two degree of freedom model, you have to essentially put the dash pot there, which is not is well known. That's not a good way to uh, represent damping on a real solid system. So I'm going to show you results for two um, models of damping. One is the so called Kelvin Voigt uh, viscoelastic damping. And this is the uh, first mode. Uh, and this is the second mode and this is the force versus frequency and this is the force toward the aluminum mass and this is the force toward the brass mass and uh, for these parameters uh, for the brass mass being 60 grams and the aluminum mass being 7 grams and a Q equals 60 it looks like this and using uh, again uh, a scaling factor then I get this the interesting thing is that this if you, if you forget about these moles that are, are very small, which are, these are, this one is due to electrostriction, by the way, really tiny, by the way. This, can you see it? Uh, anyway, this is what I call the second mode because it is the one can be larger. It is much more than the first mode. And according to this type of damping, we we'll say, well, it will not make much sense to have much hopes in using that mode for the Woodward effect. However, if you use fluid damping, you get the opposite, which is, the, the first mode looks like this, and this is the one that's being tested, getting a force of around uh, 5 micronewtons, but the second mode uh, looks uh, larger. But I think that this is, uh, the fluid damping is unphysical for a number of reasons, and the one that is uh, correct is this one. So the most interesting thing to look at the experiment, I think, that have been done, by Heidi and Jim are the ones where they change the brass mass and they look at what happened to the force. 
So let me uh, recollect what happened. When they have the uh, masses at both ends being the same, they got that the force was equal to uh, zero, and that, uh, and that makes sense theoretically, and that was great that they found that experimentally. And, however, um, she, she looked at brass masses starting about uh, 50 to 60 grams, which is, this is in a log scale, is somewhere here, and then they found that it increases as you increase the brass mass. So it's more a, a, a pretty good correspondence with the theoretical model. I was very interested for the project with NASA to see, well, what happens if the brass mass becomes very large because we had to, to move a very large ship. Is it going to go to zero? Well, it doesn't. According to the model, actually, it becomes constant there, which is pretty good. So it looked like if this model operates, you could be able to find it. However, according to fluid damping, there should be a, a bigger peak, and actually the force as you increase the mass should be uh, smaller, which is not as hopeful. What I'm very interested in, and I told Heidi I hope that she, she conducts, is number one, when she does these experiments to get actual data, I, rather than just being qualitative, uh, telling me, okay, I'm getting a peak, I like to know, uh, I like to plot these points here, you know, for this brass mass, what is the force you got? For this, what do you get? And so on, and then I can compare with the theory. And I want to compare with what the heck is going on here, because according to these models, below the brass mass that she's testing, there is another spot where you have a force in the opposite direction, which is uh, about the same as what she's testing now, and this is happening with a lower brass mass, and according to fluid damping, this force is actually larger. And it would be interesting to see uh, what other happens. Why? Because it will allow me to discriminate between the damping models and also it will make me feel more comfortable. Is this a real effect? And so um, this is also very sensitive to the aluminum mass that is on the, how do you call it, the, the one that's, uh, you call it the cap, the cap end. The end cap. This is for 10 grams, and uh, for when you go to 7 uh, grams, then uh, the behavior is about the same, but you get this very strange behavior here uh, when you use the fluid damping model. But even when you use the scholastic damping model, the force here for a smaller aluminum mass, it becomes larger. So there are, there are interesting things that may be happening when you have a small brass mass and it's very sensitive to the to distribution of masses. So, so to recapitulate. Um, what was the model and what was the experiment? The red one is the model. The experiment is not there because I don't. We don't have a, any actual uh, numerical results. I just got a saying uh, that uh, we we they say they saw that the, there was an optimal mass somewhere around 0.1 but uh, there are no actual results, so there are no experiments here. These are all... Uh, what's really the difference results. between the red and black, uh, sorry, red and blue curves? What? If you look, if you look at, the, at this curve here, you, you have, as uh, so you increase the frequency, you have a first peak, which is a force in the direction toward the brass mass, then as you increase the frequency, it reverses direction, and you have a force to in the opposite direction, and as you increase the frequency, you have a, uh, another force in this direction. And what I'm doing is I'm plotting the f uh, maximum force in this direction and the maximum force in this direction. Oh, I see. Okay. So, recapitulating, again, the nine confusions. Confusion number one is confusing the local potential with the total universe potential. Confusion number two, is looking for the Woodward effect in places where he himself said that it was not there, like uh, Mr. Williams did. Um, uh, confusion number three is that there is no valid 1D model of Mach effect space propulsion. You cannot pull uh, yourself from your bootstraps when you're in space. <laughs> you cannot have total energy fluctuation without having damping, because if you don't have damping, the total energy is constant. No, there's no sense in predicting frequency dependence when you're doing an experiment at resonance and you're neglecting damping because uh, that controls the amplitude. The magnitude of mass fluctuation has to be compatible with existing dynamic physical data. It cannot be uh, uh, milligrams. Uh, it, it, it goes against a huge number of experimental values. 
All energy gravitates. Mechanical energy is not the only energy with a gravitational potential. Kinetic energy gravitates, and electromagnetic energy gravitates. <coughs> the M in Holland and Lickel theory is not a local mass source, it's not even a mass. It is associated with a particle that has no mass. It's a field that is permeating all of space just like gravitons. It's a companion particle field. And finally, remember, it's mass energy there, the rules inertia here, but it's only fluctuating the mass here. You can derive all of this from, uh, from Siamak himself, and you will see that the one uh, term where you have hope is the one that uh, holner Likker has, the one that brands Dicker has. It is not in general relativity. In general relativity are these terms. They are very small. The, uh, brands and Dicker were not fools. Holland and Alicker were not fools. Jordan was not a fool. They were looking at this, Brands and Dickey and Holland and Alicker at this because they were interested in looking at the Mach principle effect. And in general relativity, you can have very anti machian solutions. And uh, finally, the exact solution I have is a partial, the latest one is a partial differential equation for a continuous stack with an infinite number of degrees of freedom. Therefore, I have all, all, the, all the mode shapes and uh, eigenfrequencies. However, the solution is very sensitive to the damping mechanism and it's very, very sensitive to the mass distribution. And actually, I was liking when you were saying, Maxim, that you wanted to have an interferometer to actually see what the heck is going on with the, the bisolated stack at different places because it's also very sensitive to this uh, stack mass distribution. And it's presently being done by hand. I don't know, you know, so this one end has more epoxy than another. And another. It would be nice to have a stack that is that's uniform. The first thing is to measure. So uh, there is good agreement with scanned data that there is some kind of, uh, of uh, an optimum mass there for the brass mass. But I would like her to Heidi, to give me actual numerical data, and I would like her to have data that has a brass mass that is lower than 65 grams. And thank you for watching. Yes, sir. Could you uh, explain to us the physical content of the kelvin voigt viscoelastic damping and also the fluid damping? Uh, give, give a model of uh, what, what is the damping. Okay. Uh, it, you know, I, I hate doing this because uh, uh, the, in, in text people do this and then they, they get a mechanistic idea which is not true. But it's true that the the best way to explain it is a sink of a spring and a dash pot that are connected in parallel. Oh, in parallel. Yes. Okay. Uh, the Maxwell model of bicolastic damping would be a spring and a dash pot that are connected in series. Therefore, a Maxwell model has some, some fluid characteristics because when you are in series, right, the, the dash pot can act like as if you have a frequency which is very slow then it will behave like a fluid. So, so the Maxwell model to behave like yeah, a solid. What model? Yeah. Sorry, I, I, Maxwell. The Maxwell. Maxwell. Maxwell himself. Maxwell himself oh. did work oh, in solid okay. mechanics besides electromagnetics. Oh. And he came up and he has. If you have very low frequencies, it behaves like a fluid. If you have high frequencies, it behaves like a solid. The Kelvin boy, Kelvin was Lord Kelvin, came up with a model with where you have the spring and the dashboard in, in parallel. In parallel. And therefore, it's a solid. It's never a fluid. Oh. The reason why I don't like this is because they, it's not true that when you do the partial differential equations, that what you have is a, a, at the micro level a lot of uh, bisque, uh, uh, dampers and springs. This is just a way for you to think about it. Uh, sure, that helps. Yeah, thank but you. you're still continuing with both models just to see, because you're not sure. Which uh, one is right? I have both models as, as an extreme. The, actually, I like the most. Uh, there is a model uh, which is sometimes is called uh, structural damping or hysteretic damping. I don't know what you're familiar with, where uh, on the if you have a, a, a dynamic equation, right, mass times the acceleration plus the spring constant times the displacement equals to a force, right? Uh, the spring constant, you can imagine that as be having an imaginary term that is proportional to tan delta. You may have seen this, 
there, there are instruments called dynamic uh, thermal me mechanical analysis that measure that, right? E and delta and so on, if you have a... And that kind of damping uh, uh, models a lot of uh, structures that uh, Crandall at MIT showed in the 1970s that it violates causality. And therefore, uh, it, uh, because it has also, you can show that actually there are advanced waves and, and, and uh, retarded waves that are viscoelastic, that are, that are acoustically going in the material. So uh, many people say, well, don't use that, use Kelvin Boyd. But it turns out that that model is in between the fluid and the Kelvin Boyd. And it's actually when you, I have uh, a history of working in uh, materials, uh, rubber, polyurethane, and so on. It model is the one that models the behavior of materials the best, even though it violates causal causality. But uh, it may maybe it's another another uh, <laughs> way to apply the the, uh, the handshake. <laughs> so yes, Jose, thank you very much for this enlightenment. Uh, three uh, quick questions. Uh, the first one is because you don't believe in any of the previous derivations. Which uh, um, uh, mass variation equation are you using for your predictions? So are you using Jim's original equation? The delta m depends on on the um, derivative of power. Uh, uh, I, uh, der I derive it from first principles based on the second derivative of the local mass with respect to time, and then I'm saying I'm putting a coupling constant there, which is that uh, factor of uh, 10,000 to 1 million, and I and explain it that this is due to the mediation of the dilaton, which is a scalar field that is, that is uh, giving you this force. This can be again from Jordan's Brands Dickey. If you, I showed you that there was a scalar field equation, was separate from the tensor field equation, which had the, the scalar field, the, the, the wave operator of the, of the scalar field, and the, and the mass density, and, the, and that is where the scalar field couples uh, to the local mass. Because Brands and Dickey, on perp they, you could also have coupling at the level of the T, the stress energy tensor, but it violates the weak uh, equivalence principle, which is highly debated thing. So I, I assume that the weak equivalence principle is not violated, and that's where the, the uh, coupling is going on. Okay, thanks. The second question is, you said no push and pull or whatever. So in your model, you have um, everything is in free space. I have push and pull. But I push and pull because I have more than one degree of freedom. I'm saying you cannot have push and pull because I can push here on this thing because I, I'm, my feet have friction against the ground, right? If you, if you uh, put some ice here and so on, I'm going to end up on the floor right. if I try are to push. Know, are you calculating a free space solution, so how the thrust would operate in free space? Yes. Or on the ground on the thrust belt? I calculate both. Okay, is there a difference? Yes. How, how big? Uh, it, it, it was in my original article and I discussed it with Maxime, but basically uh, the uh, effects are occurring uh, at uh, the level at which the optimum brass mass takes place. It's, a very, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting effect. You would say from the point of view of order one, it doesn't make a difference, but if you, for example, when Heidi says, hey guys, you have here, this is the optimal mass, it's seven, I don't know, it's 80 grams, what is it nowadays? Uh, it, it does make a difference. That, that's an optimal mass for her experiment here, where in a clamp uh, boundary condition, if, if it wouldn't be in space, that would not be the optimal mass anymore. anymore. Okay, thank you. And the third one is, um, I mean, we all know that the gravitation constant is not the most precise uh, 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 constant in nature. Do you think that because you allow here for a varying uh, gravitational constant, that it actually has to do with these different gravitational constant measurements, different labs, different times, and so on? Uh, it's not a... Um the, if, I, if I understand what you're saying, you're, are you saying that the, besides the variation of the gravitational constant with respect to time, there's a, uh, a possibility of the gravitational constant G varying with respect to space? Is that what you're saying? Well, it, it's, um, there are lots of measurements for gravitational constants, right? And they all do not agree, right? So we make an average of a huge <coughs> error bar. That's one of the big mysteries, right? So no, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I, I am not taking on that. I'm only saying I am only dealing with the uh, possibility started by Dirac 
that the gravitational constant should be a function of time, uh, uh, and uh, which now have been disproven to a large extent uh, within those very high limits, and saying, well, it may be a function of time at high frequencies of about 34 kilohertz. A function of time. It's a function of, a, but you're saying it's varying? A, fi a function of frequency, in this case. Okay. Because of, yes. Uh, you alluded at some point to the fact that <coughs> these mock uh, drives might work much better if you were very far out on an inner Earth. Do you stand by that statement or did that go away at some I point? I only stand by that. I, I am agnostic on that. I'm saying I show you uh, two experimental results, one from 2004, saying that, they, that there is no hope on that because the coupling constant was between 10 and 10 to the 7. Yeah. But uh, the one from 2014, based on the supernova type 1a, show a uh, coupling constant for the scalar field that is uh, omega equal to minus 1, like string theory. But shouldn't the supernova have a lot more mass than the, even the sun and therefore have the same problem? Or, uh, the, in the vicinity of a supernova, it seems like you have know, 10 solar masses or yes. something, and so I don't understand why that's better, why that's different from being in the solar system. I uh, have to go, uh, I understand that they are using the uh, Bayesian methods and uh, I have to go and see how, what are they actually measuring, that's is what they are measuring, uh, the measurement here, and it's going through interstellar space. So, uh, you, uh, that is one reason to be, uh, to question that. The other one is again that they're using Bayesian methods. What do you think, are you a frequentist or a Bayesian? <laughs> I'm agnostic on that matter. <laughs> 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 so, but let's say, let's say there is some hope. A string series says that it's equal to minus one. Corey says that there is a chameleon effect. And we have the experimental results. So there is, there is hope that uh, it could be due to that. How long do you say that the one like the theory, the M is, is a mass field? And it starts out by saying the mass of one particle is due to the summing of masses of all, everything else in the universe. It starts out with an MA and an MB, and all the subscripts on these mass, mass field things. But as you go to a smooth fluid, the, the subscripts disappear because all the masses are identical to each other. All It's a smooth fluid. So I, I don't think I ever said that the mass was the mass of the Particle. I said it was a, a mass fluctuation of that mass field, which has to be there if the mass is fluctuating, because uh, they, they go hand in hand with each other. Uh, what, uh, well, I didn't say that you said it, but uh, actually what the article says, uh, your article, Mac uh, Effect 2, it says that uh, that is the term, the Woodward effect term, here. It looks like it. Says, no, it says, he says, apart Apart from a forcer numerical factor, these are the math fluctuation terms originally derived by one of us. So uh, when I read that, I said, well, okay, this... Is, yeah, it's the, a mass field, though, so the mass field is fluctuating. Okay, I'm just saying that... It would have to fluctuate in the same way as the mass itself. When, when I read this, I, I had never heard of the whole analytical theory. I saw a, a little m here, and little m it sounds like the so local mass. You want, I and he said, and he said that these are the math fluctuation terms originally derived by one of us. So I read, okay, this is the math fluctuation term derived by Jim, but it's not. It's not. No, I agree. It's but, not. but it says that it is. Um, I think I no. So that's, that's what, what I'm saying. What I said because earlier on I, I mentioned the mass and it was the mass field of all molecules. Yeah, it? it says a lot of things, but they are contradictory. So when I read the paper, I say, okay, one hand but it says. You say that the mass is not the mass. You say it's a particle field. You know it uh, again. Still includes the, the mass of the particle. Uh, again, uh, the particle field whole analytical theory. Uh, everybody agree. I think agrees. Correct me if I'm wrong. That it's not viable. And and also, is it this M doesn't have any mass. The dilaton doesn't have any mass. I suspect she meant to say mass field. These are the mass fluctuation term, but this is not a, this is not only not a local mass. It doesn't have any mass. So when I when I read that, I said nobody there said me. No, I'm not going to solve that. So, but it, it, okay, to me that's the way. It's, I never said you said it. That's the way I read it. It doesn't, it doesn't have any mass. Huh? Sorry.
label the mass a little yeah. bit better. Whether it's the terms are very badly labeled in the original paper, so I, yeah. I tried to improve the labeling on it. I may have made a mess of it, so <laughs> it, they probably are better. But anyway, so it, it, what I will do is I wouldn't use M here. I will use phi like the, like, uh, like uh, Brans Dickey. I wouldn't use the theory at all because it is all already in Brans Dickey. So why even talk about the theory, the whole analytical theory? What is the justification? Just the way they set it up was very what, Machian. What, the, what is the justification? But the Brans Dickey is also Machian. And so at one point I said, oh, OK, may, maybe uh, they are talking about the whole analytical theory because it's a conformal theory. It is very interesting. It's a conformal theory. Then at one point I said, are they the first one that, that came up with a conformal theory? And then I found out, no, it was Dickey came up with a conformal uh, version of Brands Dickey's theory in 1962 before Hoyle and Alika ever did anything uh, on, uh, on this. So uh, it, it is contained within Jordan's theory. Uh, Brands Dickey is already Machian. Uh, it, uh, the conformal theory claim is, was already fulfilled by uh, Dickey himself. So the only thing I'm, I remain that uh, Hall and Alicard have contributed is the advanced wave, uh, retarded wave explanation. And uh, that's the only thing that... that oh, but uh, Shiyama had that. Shiyama had that already. You ever say that? Yeah, the, the paper from 1964, I think. Yeah, not, not the 1953, but the 1964. Yeah, uh, and I think that, that was before, uh, I don't know, it was slightly before Hall and Alicard did their work, yeah. So then at that point, then I said, well, Lord and behold, that's why nobody talks about Hall and Alicard. There's no reason to talk about it. You know that the Jord Jordan in 1951, if you go to his German book, you will see that he has the field to a power gamma. So remember that uh, Hall and Alicard goes like the square root of G, Brands Dickey goes is inverse of G, Jordan had a more, more uh, general. He had a, a, a power. The power can be two, it can be one, it can be in, it, anything. It had to be found by experiment. So. Well, yeah, I didn't know about uh, Brand Dickey before I read the whole article. I read the whole article first, yeah. and then I knew about Brand Dickey. So for me, it was the other way around. Okay. So I think that's all for now. Yes. Thank you for dampening profusions of confusions. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, yeah, Adam has a question. Oh, no. Just, it's more a question tying into yesterday's presentation um, by Professor Tamar um, about the mass fluctuation experiment and the plans for that and the uh, and the uh, dissent about the or about the energies at the root of mass fluctuation. Um, Perhaps you should talk about this later, not. Maybe you, maybe you. I, I, this, uh, I, actually, I asked uh, John Kramer at the, at the NIAC meeting. Uh, there's a very interesting effect to me that uh, you can have a binary uh, black hole system uh, spinning and then coalescing, and then you can have a kick uh, effect where one of the black holes with a stellar system, that means with a number of uh, suns going, stars going around it, gets kicked out of the galaxy. This is uh, amazing. The one, one of the a three body. Right? You, you got. You, you can't in a binary system. You can't kick things out. But in a three body effect, nature doesn't like to solve the problem, so she goes one. <laughs> The, the third body being the stellar system? Or? I think these, these things you see moving very fast because of some kind of thing or the result of, of three body, a three-body interaction. It's a very common. In but which are the three bodies? You have the, the two black holes, and which is the third one? I don't know. I mean, the, the, there had to be three bodies for that kind of ejection to take place. So I asked another uh, gentleman that is in the uh, NIAC uh, committee, and he said, um, it is the angular, not you, another one, uh, that it, it, is, it must be the angular momentum converting into linear momentum. And John, John, John separately very well told me, no, that cannot be so, because you cannot convert uh, angular momentum into linear momentum. Anyway, this, these are very par the reason why I mention it is from what you said yesterday, these are very powerful events, there's a lot of energy, a lot, there's a lot of kinetic energy, uh, if we are talking about the Wilbur Mack effect of experiment here, you have an experiment where you have uh, very large dynamics, and it would be very interesting to look at, uh, at this at that thing from that point of view.
Well, you know, there are, uh, it's a phenomenon of jets from this uh, central black hole of, uh, of many, many galaxies. That's a kind of, um, you know, uh, well, it's maybe yeah, in that example. kind of system you can have all kinds of things. Though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you can have jets, and so that's that's an example. But having a black hole itself ejected, I think, requires a three million interaction. I'll tell you what. Uh, let's thank Jose once again, and then. We hope you have enjoyed this video and for more videos go to freakphysics.com.